here in the Digital DJ Tips studio. Uh, that's Faye in the background there who will be disappearing in a bit, uh, busy working on putting a laid back Luke competition live. But uh, that's not what we're talking about today because today we're focusing on mobile DJs and my special guest with me to help look at the five big mistakes that mobile DJs make is Mr. Jason Janai, who by the magic of, uh, by the, magic of uh, the internet, I can throw onto the screen now. Hello, Jason. <laughs> well, listen, man, it's good to have you here uh, with us as ever. Uh, it's always good to uh, it's always good to have you in on these things. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know Jason, Jason is one of the top wedding DJs, if not the top wedding DJ in the USA. When the Super Bowl is having an after party, Jason's the man they call. When Wedding Wire and The Knot have a party for all the DJs on their books, Jason's the man who plays it. So he's kindly, we were having a meeting about uh, our forthcoming wedding DJ training program. And we are, um, we are, um, he's, he's kindly agreed to stay on the line and do this. So, um, that's very kind of him. I've sorted his sound out as well. For those of you saying earlier that Jason is not uh, audible, that's all been sorted, so that's good. Uh, and Jason's going to talk, as I say, about the five biggest mistakes that DJs make. So Jason, we're going to launch straight in. I'm going to do some <coughs> shout outs to people in between the questions uh, because I want to give value right from the off here. Uh, but before we do start, whether you're on YouTube, whether you're on Facebook, if you're not on our global DJ network, you should be. That is the place to watch this and to network with other DJs. Go to the Digital DJ Tips Facebook page, click on send message and just send the word join and our team will do the rest. They'll get you into that secret group. Do it afterwards, but that's the place to watch these things. Right, Jason, I'm going to read out these five mistakes you've chosen and then I'm going to switch over to you and you are going to explain why they are big mistakes and what to do instead. So number one in our five big mistakes that DJs always make when they are trying to be mobile DJs for the first time is playing for themselves and not for the audience. So Jason, what's this one about? I think that one's pretty straightforward, but it really goes all around the thought process of like, especially when people are new to the private event space, coming from the nightlife world where in the nightlife world, you primarily are focused on taking care of, you know, not only uh, keeping people in, in the zone, but you're, you're playing like the latest and greatest hits. In the private event space, that does work at some events, but you also have to take into consideration the people that are in front of you. So when you're when you're working at a, a wedding or a private event, I, I think the thing to remember is you have a different universe of people in front of you. Your, de your target demographic is not just 21 to 31 year olds or whatever it is. The, the, the pool of people in front of you is a lot more vast. There's a lot more universes of, of, of people. So look at the age game groups of the people and I think one of the common mistakes people do or uh, DJs really make when they first come into the into the overall zone is the fact that they're not on the money they're they're, they're playing things that they might prefer as opposed to what will get someone that is um, you know 20 or 30 years older than them in into the music right think of when people graduate high school think how of their age groups think of their background where they're coming from what they could possibly Im into so i think the one of the biggest mistakes is djs tend to play what is most comfortable to them based on their personal preferences as opposed to what it will take to get the entire room you know to a whole nother level okay so um it is a common thing, isn't it? Because when DJs are playing in a club or when they're playing a the kind of music that they enjoy, <clears throat> they tend to gravitate towards gigs where they get to play the kind of music they enjoy, right? It's only natural. If you're a house DJ, you want to play house gigs. If you're a hip hop DJ, you want to play hip hop gigs. If you're a tech house DJ, hey, guess what? You want to play tech house. But with, it's different with mobile because it's going to be different not only generally, but also gig to gig, right? You've got to have a little bit more flexibility on your feet. I think you need to have a better understanding of a lot more, right, when you're doing private events, if you're a mobile DJ. So you need to be able to be familiar with what was hot in the 80s, the 90s, the 70s, the 60s, right? Aunt Brenda might be, you know, 60 years old, and she's not going to want to bump to the latest Fisher album that, like, is crushing it in the club because she's not going to understand that. When Aunt Brenda went to high school, it was – you know, the late 70s or the early 80s. So you have to think about what was hot 
when she went out with her friends or what was hot when she was in college or whatever. And I think that's kind of like the thing that you need to be able to do. So you need to be able to bridge the gap and not play for yourself and what's most comfortable based on your personal preferences, but to be able to kind of like separate yourself, check the ego at the door and play what it's going to take to make the room kind of get to the next level. And that's looking at all the different universes of people, the, the people that kill it in the mobile game in the private event DJ world are people that can twist and tie all these different genres together seamlessly um, and, and kind of make it inclusive for everyone of all ages. Cool. Okay. So Lisa um, is saying mistake number one, also not understanding what kind of vibe the client wants to create. Waylon is saying it's mitigated by getting a playlist of favorite tunes from the client. So these are, these are all good things to, to add to that. So thank you, Lisa. Uh, and Waylon, shout outs to Jack and Neil. Neil says there was no sound from Jason, but we sorted that one out now, Neil. Uh, but thank you for <coughs> thank you for that. Uh, hi to everyone over on YouTube, to John and to Enya, who's in Halifax, uh, to uh, J W Groniweg, uh, who says just read Jason's lips, he'll be all right. But anyway, Jason, just so uh -huh. you know, we, we've sorted your sound out. Uh, we we did it immediately. All right, so if you're just joining us, we're doing five things that new mobile and event DJs often get wrong. And my guest today is Jason Janai, one of America's premier wedding DJs, uh, who is kindly giving up a bit of his time at the beginning of his day to be with us here on Tuesday Tips Live. And number two, well, the clue is this big fat thing in front of me on the screen. It's not using the microphone properly. Now, I know a lot of DJs are going to be thinking, ah, the microphone. <laughs> but Jason, the microphone is really important for mobile event wedding DJs, right? I, I, I believe so. And I'm not someone that spends an endless amount of time on the microphone, you know, like running on and on and on. I think the key to using a microphone um, effectively is providing clear and and very precise direction when there's a point to do it. I also think that um, enunciating and speaking properly is super important in this conversation. And I also think um, the way you hold the microphone and the way that you use the microphone is important. So in a club, when I have everyone bouncing up and down, I might grab the microphone by the actual head of the microphone and talk into it. Everyone put your hands up, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't work it could work, but it doesn't always work in the wedding space because it's going to sound muffled. It's going to sound, you know, if you're speaking clearly and then you're doing something like that later on, it could impact the overall presentation. I think it's super important that when you're using a microphone, you're clear with your direction, you're providing precise direction and you're not running on and on and on. And I feel that the engagement of the of, and use of the microphone needs to kind of be to achieve something, provide direction, or to kind of direct attention into something that's happening real time. So I've been at gigs with you, Jason. I've seen the way you use the microphone. The music goes down very, very quiet. You are very loud uh, and commanding the room, telling them what to do, leading people like sheep through the event. And and that's kind of the difference, isn't it? As you say, to to not only club DJs who might, you know, we've seen videos of DJs. I've seen in the Hardwell documentary, you see him plugging his headphones into the Pioneer Mixer and just screaming into them, you know, the odd word or two to the crowd. They don't care what you're saying. Their arms all go up. Um, it's um, the same as really poor mobile DJs who, as you say, just they, they muffle their voice, they mutter into the microphone. No one really knows what they're saying. And especially at a mobile event where people feel like they ought to be behaving correctly, they ought to be helping the person whose party they're at to have a great time, right? Especially if it's a bride or it's a wedding. People want to know what to do. They want to get clear instructions. So your your tip about you know making sure you're, you're heard, does this go across to making sure everyone's listening before you tell them something important as well? So in other words, getting their attention before delivering yeah, the message. Absolutely. You have to kind of pull everyone's attention in before you start giving them demands. At the same time, when you're speaking or if there's an announcement to be made, you're not doing it in the middle of a chorus of a song that everyone's singing. You're waiting for the break. You're trying to time things right so that people can clearly understand and hear and interpret what direction you're giving them, what you're asking them to do, how you're commanding. You're ducking the music, bringing the, mute, the volume level down and then speaking. So it's not like competing with one another where it gets lost. You're making sure that it's, it's, it's sound checked and it's balanced so that your voice does stand out on top of the music when it needs to, you know, okay. uh, I think all this stuff is important. 
Okay, cool. So Mystic has got a question for you. So Mystic says, I'm shy on the mic. How do I get used to it? Um, I think that's just, you have every, I think everyone goes through a period of time where they're shy on the microphone. I think in this instance, you just have to start engaging and start off slow and start engaging little by little and increasing kind of your presence as you need to. Now, I'm not someone that talks endlessly at a wedding. I do have the ability to turn up when need be, but a lot of times I rely on the music to do the talking for me. I think it's super important that people, when they are you know, getting into this, the nerves and, and the things that come with kind of the anxiety of speaking and that uncomfortable feeling, um, I think that's just a natural kind of uh, experience a lot of people go through. And even still to this day, there are events where I have to kind of like get control over my mind because I'm a little worked up before I go out and say something. I think with practice and time, those feelings tend to kind of subside and they, of course, like go down a little bit. Awesome. Thanks for that reply there. I hope that helped. Uh, and also, that's not going to be the only person here who's felt that, those kind of nerves. They're very normal. I'm going to read out a few uh, comments coming in here. Uh, Barry says, uh, an ego is the worst thing to bring to a private gig, especially a wedding. Um, Duke says, can you give us some, uh, can, you do, can you do one of these broadcasts on what old wedding DJs get wrong? That would be Oosh. one where we'd have to tread carefully there, I think, but you never know. Uh, Angelo says, sometimes the requests from clients or guests can kill the floor. Sometimes you have to not honor requests. Of course. Um, uh, Steve G says, uh, ha ha, I was doing a wedding for two years. I was doing weddings for two years with an ex-friend of mine. And one of the reasons I parted from him is because he loved to hear himself on the mic and annoyed clients. So there you go. Joshua has got a question for you. Uh, we've had someone kind of with the same kind of question already. I'll read it out. Joshua says, what happens when the bride and groom or the person throwing the party wants you to play the newest and freshest <coughs> music, but the average age of the room doesn't fit the description of a crowd that would be down with that? Does that make sense, Jason? Yeah, of course. And I, I think that's something that we... Uh, so if you're doing weddings, chances are your couples are in their 20s or 30s and they're gonna have parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and people that are outside of their age demographic there in attendance, they have coworkers, whatever. I think the key to introducing new music or newer music is by kind of like bookending it with things that are working for the room. So like, for instance, um, there's, there, I call them bridge tracks. I and mean, a bridge track would be something that like might be pushing the boundaries for, you know, it could be a Donza Kuduro, it could be an Uptown tongue, uh, uptown Funk, it sh could be, now these songs are not something that I would play if I went out to a club. I'm not saying they don't work or whatever, it's just something I wouldn't play. But in the private event space, that is what's familiar to a lot of people. And I'm not trying to make my events basic or vanilla or just generic. But if you're gonna introduce a new track, you need to be able to kind of frame it in with things that really, really, you know, will work. And I would never play a song until I own the room or I own the dance floor. I would make sure that if there was 200 people at this event, all 200 people were on the dance floor and boom, you play the track. And you have to make sure it makes sense. You have to be able to take risks every once in a while and, of course, play it. Because, you know what, if people are lost in the moment and they're having a good time, chances are they'll be able to flex a little bit and they'll let go and they'll enjoy it. I can play you hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of videos of people dancing to music that they have absolutely no idea what I'm playing. But I didn't just play it random. I kind of played it in the context of it was embedded in a moment or as part of a moment that kind of was thread together by things that made sense to them. And whether I was using a a bootleg of something that kind of set it up nice or I, I played something that might have a different kind of like a mashup kind of like uh, feel to it. Like there's a lot of ways that you can kind of do this. It is possible. You just have to know your crowd. And I think understanding and playing for the people in front of you is what's most important, right? So if you never just introduce a new track by just jamming it in and throwing it in there and, and, and trying to crush your room with it, try to thread it in a mix of, of stuff that's already working or stuff that will fly with the room and kind of like sneak it in there. And that will give you a sense of what you can do even further as the event kind of like goes on. Awesome. Yeah. And I love the, the, the tip there, you know, don't try this stuff until you own the room. You know, you've got to earn, <clears throat> it's almost like a bank account, isn't it? 
you're putting money in all the time, keeping them happy. And when there's enough in there, you can take a bit out and by playing those edgier tracks when people are trusting you a bit more. All right, then, a few, uh, if you've just joined us, we're doing five, <coughs> excuse me, we're doing five um, mistakes that new mobile DJs always make. I have Jason Janai on as my guest, one of America's premier wedding DJs, who is talking us through these mistakes. Uh, a few more comments coming in. Uh, Steve says, make sure you do a mic check, like walking around the room to each corner, nook and cranny, and make sure your mic and speakers are set up right for everyone to hear you. It's all in the details. Um, Dash says, um, what old wedding DJs get wrong, eh? Uh, that course would be 48 hours long. Uh, so there you go. Kelvin I says... I would just... Let's just... For him real quick, I just wanted to say, stay relevant. If you're not relevant, you don't belong doing this. You have to work to stay relevant. That's like my my tip for the older dudes that are still trying to like live the life here in the in the, in the the current <coughs> world of, of, of private event entertainment. Work to stay relevant. Be familiar with the new music, the trends, the culture. Go out every once in a while. Those are things that you can do. So hopefully that kind of like helps... You know, that, that could be a, 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 a two-day, a two-hour. Uh, that could be a whole broadcast in and of itself. Indeed. All right, then. Uh, drinking on the job is a no-go, says Kelvin. I think we can all understand that when you're being paid to, to soundtrack an important day for someone being drunk is not going to help. Uh, Juan says, I uh, had a new husband tell me to only play rock. So I did for a while till grandma came at me. What the heck are you playing? I said, your son said only rock, grandson, I think he meant. Ah, ha, ha, she said, and got on him to let me do my work. So there you go. Um, Brides and grooms get very selfish when compiling a playlist and don't think about the other guests, says Alan. Uh, And um, Amar says, uh, actually, no, Amar, that's pretty technical, but uh, I do like what you wrote there. That's good. But uh, uh, we'll pull out the more... more, um, the more general comments here for for everyone all right then we're moving on and the next uh, one on jason's list is um dj's new mobile dj's presenting themselves badly um so this could be what they look like personally or what their dj booth and their equipment looks like i'm guessing jason right yeah i, I think like um presentation is everything it's been kind of like a a foundation principle that like i've really uh, taken seriously for an extended period of time. I think the way we look, not in terms of just what we're wearing at events is important, but the way our DJ booths look, I feel like cable management, I know I see people rip about this on forums and I think people get a little bit too lost in it, but I think like, you know, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to look to part. Your your DJ booth should be super clean um, and should be tidy. It should be photo shoot fresh, as I like to call it. So like, if, 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 if you would see a picture of it and there's cables all messed up or things are not really cleaned away or if there's like, you know, used plates from cocktail hour or drinks that are empty it, anywhere visible, it doesn't look good, you know. So uh, I think presentation is everything. And I feel like when people are new to the game, they might not be focusing on that part of the actual experience. They're focused more on delivering the kind of the musical content. And, and kind of the game plan, making sure that, and I think that's super important, but I also think how you look is a big part, is a big part to hopefully extending the work and, and increasing opportunity to, to get more work in the future, right? So it's all about the experience you create, and that starts with what you look like the minute people walk into a room and they see your DJ booth, because they are gonna make a, a, a very subconscious, very quick decision like, hey, this looks good, or oh, like we're in, you know, this might be like a long night. Like people are very judgmental in certain circumstances. And I think the more that you can do to kind of tip the cards in your deck or your favor to kind of crush it, the the better off you're going to be. So presentation is a big deal. What you're wearing, how your booth looks, number one. Awesome. So presentation, don't look a mess. You know, we've all seen mobile DJs with a table uh, that's just got cables flying. You know, it doesn't cost much to, to think about what that's going to look like. Um, all right, if you've just joined us, we're doing five uh, tips, five uh, tips for new mobile DJs, mistakes mobile DJs always make when they're having a go at this. You know, people are jokingly saying, and I know you don't mean it um, in a serious way, you know, but pro tip, just don't do weddings. Uh, but look, the truth is that there's a big, big challenge in playing for a wide audience of people. There's a big challenge in playing for everyone from eight to 80. Uh, and as DJs, we ought to be, most of us, 
pretty excited by that challenge, pretty excited by stretching what we're capable of. And Jason, um, before we move on to tip number five, uh, by the way, for those of you who just joined us, you can watch the replays of all of this, but you could have caught this live by being subscribed. So click subscribe, click the bell, like us on Facebook, show our posts first, and then, then you'll see when these go live. Um, and you'll get all the fun bits, like microphones not working at the beginning and things like that. Uh, so do that stuff. Uh, yeah, the ones you missed, playing for yourselves and not for the room. Um, not using the microphone properly, presenting yourselves badly. That's the one we just had. We've actually, we just had. We've actually got two more to come for you, so you're lucky. Uh, before we um, move on uh, to that, Jason, you know, I want to give people a bit of your history because a lot of people think, oh, you know, wedding DJs, they just like to turn the microphone on and play old hits and it's not really that cool. Jason, you've got a long running um, serious, you, you had a long running serious FM show, mixing, you play house, you've got um, your own um, podcast, which you've been running for a long time. Uh, you compile music for gyms, you know, mixed music. You are an all round DJ, but you like weddings best. You like playing these crowds better than all that other stuff. You've done clubs, you've done festivals, you've done after parties, you've done mixes, you've done radio. Why do you like weddings best? I think there's a couple of reasons why I've kind of gravitated to this place in the industry and and for a couple of different reasons. So I, first and foremost, I have to say, if you don't know who I am or whatever, I can tell you that we probably have shared similar backgrounds in terms of playing and all that stuff. I never once thought I would be a, a wedding DJ full on. I never thought I would own a business that does events all over the planet. I never thought this is where I would be. If you would have asked me if this is where I would be 10, 15 years ago, I would have been like, you're absolutely nuts. There's no way I'll never do it. But the wedding DJ, the event DJ, the private event DJ, there's a lot of opportunity there to not only do cool things for cool people, but it's it's challenging, it's super rewarding. Um, you help people celebrate some of the biggest milestones of their lives. You develop relationships with people. I've been able to literally tour the entire planet. I've worked for people that you see on television or hear on radio and people that have grew up on the same childhood street as myself, and I've done that via being a private event DJ, a wedding DJ. And, um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm still lost in it. I come from the club world. I, I, I'm, I'm a content, I'm an editor for direct music service. I, I, I have a podcast. I, I've, I play some of the biggest clubs in my area. And, and when I travel around, I, I've done a lot of different things and I like to stay things. I like things to stay fresh. I love the private event space because one, I feel that I don't have to deal with the ever changing kind of, um, uh, I don't ever have to deal with like changing management and different things, that kind of thing. I don't have to deal with some bipolar owner that's yelling at me to play something that someone wants at table number 12 in terms of bottle service. I, I love taking like concept ideas. I love working with people to kind of figure and real and materialize things. I love to like have a little bit more control over like how things work. And I'm tired of going to clubs and maybe something not working or, or someone yelling at me for this or someone doing that. Um, I still love to play in the club world and I do as much as I possibly can. I think it keeps my private events uh, uh, fresh and whatnot, but I feel like the, the private event space, there's so much opportunity to do so many things. And I think one of the main reasons is because the talent there is a little bit different than like what sits in the club space. You know, when you establish yourself, you become in demand just like everywhere else, right? There's a, there's so much opportunity to kind of like, do amazing things. And for me, I don't just DJ, you know, like my company, we do media, we do lighting, we do a lot of other services as well. And from a financial perspective, there's a lot more opportunity for me to earn the money that I need to sustain and to live uh, the life I would like to live in the private event space than that currently exists in my local club market. I think that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, you know? a, lot, a lot of people have been saying that, you know, the money's, <laughs> that's where the money is. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to sustain a life as a DJ, you don't want, you don't want a proper job. Uh, you, you've got to meet somewhere in the middle with where with what people want, uh, which is another, another truth, truth that you added in there, Jason. Right, let's move on. Uh, the <laughs> next one. Uh, is using poor quality music, not using proper edits. So talk us through using poor quality music and not using proper edits, Jason. 
Well, I, I think first and foremost, like a big mistake a lot of people use is just because something crushes it in a club doesn't mean that you can use it at a private event. So it could be implied meeting. It could be a dirty edit or an unclean edit, something with curse words or cuss words, whatever, however you say it. Um, or it could be like a, a rip that was downloaded off of YouTube that might have um, – things in the actual video that are not part of the song that someone would hear on the radio, whether it be like a soundtrack, it could have some type of vocal stuff, could have an ad, a promotional ad in it. And, and I think that's also like a big thing because the last thing you want to do is play someone's uh, first dance and for it to break into the movie segment of the video and you kind of be awkwardly out there or whatever. Or you, you last thing you want to do is be crushing the dance floor, have everyone, including grandma and, and the eight-year-old brother on the dance floor. And the song's like, put your fucking hands up, you know, like whatever, and drops like the F-bomb. Like that isn't appropriate really for like the wedding space or the private event space. So there's a lot of uh, remix services out there that allow people to download clean tools uh, for this. And there's a lot of... Um, services that are out there that you can access to download the proper edits for songs so that you are prepared properly for, for your events. Yeah, I, and the truth there is that you've got different age groups and that you've got, um, I mean, the video rips thing, you shouldn't really be ripping stuff off YouTube anyway, but, you know, video edits are not the same as the edit, the audio edit, and, and it's, a, it's a classic. <coughs> I want to read you out a few, I want to read out a few things that people are saying here. Uh, crowd trolling is your best friend, uh, in weddings and clubs, it sends you in the right direction with your music and understanding what the crowd wants, says Kevin. Um, uh, always get a do not playlist. I didn't the first time and I still feel mad for making the bride break out in tears on her special day, says Mina Bina. So uh, you've learned from that, Mina Bina. We all make mistakes, but it's good that you've learned from that. Uh, Lisa says, Jason, I haven't done weddings yet, but you're selling it. Sounds like, yeah. all, the, sounds like all the things I love about DJing, says Lisa. We've so, there we've go. got a court we've got a course for you coming up <laughs> we have we have but all in all in good time um so mystic says say if you get booked for a different culture's wedding how do you prepare for that for example an american playing for an indian or a hispanic wedding jason have you ever had that situation hold on repeat that question because say concerned. if you get booked for a different culture like say for instance you get booked you're an american and you get booked to play an indian wedding or a hispanic wedding oh yep. uh, how do you deal with that um, you just do your, you have to prepare, you have to do your homework. You have to talk to the couple to ask them what they're interested in this weekend. Uh, myself, I, I, I did three weddings this past weekend. My first wedding was an Italian wedding where like the family was from Italy. My last wedding on Sunday night, it was an Italian Colombian and Syrian wedding. So like we had to do a lot of preparation because I'm not up to the like, up to speed on like the latest and greatest Syrian music dance hits. So I had to like do some homework, but there's plenty of tools out there that allow you to kind of do that. And I think a good conversation with a couple can kind of point you in the right direction to get you kind of started as to what they like. You know, if, if you're not from the USA and you were asked to do an American wedding, you know, like the first question should be like, well, where in America is the family from, right? Because New York weddings are very different than weddings that take place in St. Louis or Kentucky or California or Utah. They're all they are all American weddings, but they're very different because regionally weddings are different. And I think that goes to any place in the world. So if they're from Greece or Italy or Spain, right? If, are they from Spain in Europe? Are they Spanish, but like South American Spanish? Are they South American? Are they are they Brazilian, right? Portuguese, same thing. Brazilian or from Portugal. It's two different universes, although they may um, have the same kind of like title in terms of like uh, origin or whatever, or maybe speak the same language. It doesn't mean they're into the same things, and 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 that really goes in the in the in the Spanish world too, because Mexican weddings are very different than Puerto Rican weddings, are very different than Colombian weddings, very different than Venezuelan weddings, and, and very different. So the key to those weddings is just do your homework. So Mystic says thank you for that. Yeah, I mean it's 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 true. And one little tip that I can give you is that if you go to Shazam, not on your phone, but Shazam on. Um, the internet go to go to a browser and type in shazam.com you can look up the current charts in any city anywhere in the world uh, and you'll see the differences 
across state in America, you'll see the differences in Scotland, from Ireland, from, from Wales, from London, uh, and, and, and anywhere else. So, you know, a little, little extra Easter egg there for you. Have a look at the Shazam website if you haven't, people. It's pretty awesome. Um, uh, Amir says, uh, Amir's uh, saying about weddings in, uh, and Amir did say where these weddings were, but basically, I think, it, think of a Persian. I think Amir said Persian weddings. If you listen to some six, eight rhythms in music, you'd understand what I'm talking about. They're really hard to play, says Amir. Um, Kelvin says, I outsource my uh, events like this because I'm not bilingual. And I think if you're not from the culture, you can't understand it. For example, Spanish. <coughs> Uh, if you can't speak it, how do you know what you're playing? I guess the difference there is, you know, if um, you're playing in a place where you've got two cultures in one room, there's going to be a dominant language, right? Um, uh, but anyway, all right, let's move on. Um, and the next uh, point, the fifth and final point that Jason has pulled out is, and by the way, if you have just joined us, we're covering five mistakes that new mobile DJs make, is acting like an equipment hire company not a DJ. So Jason, um, a little bit loaded that, but you know, it gets the point across. What's this one mean? I think a lot of DJs, when they put together their promotional marketing collateral, when they put together the websites, when they talk about the things that make them the best asset for someone's event, they focus on the stuff, not on the why. And unfortunately, people don't care that you have 100,000 songs in your music library. They don't care that you have a state of the art music system or that you use the very best lighting. Like those things are just things. Um, and if that's what you're using to sell yourself, you're probably missing the mark. Stop talking about the stuff and start talking about the why and the how why you do what you do and how you do what you do to kind of produce the results. I think that'll help kind of close the gap and hopefully help you increase your sales opportunity, closure and all that in the future. Stop talking about the stuff because no one cares about the stuff. If they're hiring you for their entertainment for their wedding, they're assuming you have the stuff capable of doing the event. So one, stop talking about the stuff. And two, don't promise things you can't have. I think that kind of goes in the same conversation. Make sure that you're only a, you're only talking about things that you're capable of delivering and don't over promise things that you're not able to deliver because that will just lead to someone's expectations not being met and you, and you potentially impacting the most expensive event someone's gonna have for themselves. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jason, for that. And you've got mm -hmm. two or three more minutes left, people. If you've got any questions for Jason, one of the top wedding DJs in the US uh, who's joined us, uh, not only uh, for this, but also joined us to make a course that we'll be releasing later this year, uh, which is going to be very exciting. But we'll tell you more about that a bit later on. And Jason's been answering the five big things that new mobile and wedding DJs always get wrong and they were playing for yourself and not for the room uh, not using the microphone properly uh, presenting yourself badly whether the way you're dressed or your equipment uh, using poor quality music YouTube rips uh, unclean versions of tunes and so on um, and finally acting like an equipment hire company so while you're asking your last questions and while Jason types away there no doubt sorting out his gig for tonight um, we will um, drop in one bonus one uh, and so this was one that Jason insisted we included after we'd given this a title and Jason your bonus one is not being aware of the volume level yeah uh, so tell us I feel like that's one of the things that distinguishes someone that's been involved in the in the game for a while and someone that maybe is new to the game um, when you're overplaying a room or you're too loud or you're not loud enough I feel like people have body language and there's some some things that they do that can tell you kind of like visually or, you know, if you're on the right mark or if not. And one of the tips that I like to do <clears throat> for anyone joining our company or, or working with us at SCE is, you know, at the after playing a room for an hour, hour and a half, walk outside for for five minutes, let your ears reset and walk back in and just listen to the, your volume levels because you can become kind of t tuned and dialed into like the room and, and the levels that you might not even be aware of how loud you actually are. Look for people that are struggling to have conversation. Look for people that are holding their ears. Look for things where people are like talking very loudly into someone's face. Look that if you make an announcement, people are not able to hear what they say. Like those are telltale sounds that you're not dialed in with the actual body language. And I guess the presence of the room, one of the key things here is 
just being playing at the right volume level because when you do a sound check and there's no one in the room, it's one thing. When you put 200 people in the room, it's something different. And the music should scale up and down with the event and the parameters of the event, the milestones of the event. So during the meal service, you might be lower than when you have 200 people in the dance floor. You're going to play a lot louder because you want to. You want them to feel that moment, that that energy part of the celebration. And when it's time for cake cutting or special dances, it might be a little bit lower. The grand entrance, boom, it's going to be louder. Like there's a lot of different things that you need to be aware of, and I think that's something that it's never one volume all night long. There's different levels over the course of the overall day mm, that you need so to be keep, aware of. Keeping it dynamic. Uh, Jason, a couple of people saying, uh, what is written on your shirt? Maybe you can uh, just stand up a bit and let them have a look. Yeah. So Weddings wedding. and fashion and corporate and industry and nightlife, SCE event group, your company. Awesome. Thanks for that. DJ Dash says, I always make sure I walk around during audio check, during setup to make sure it isn't annoying. I, I hate to see people scream at each other, not able to have a conversation. Um, so, uh, Victor says, thank you for all the great tips. Lisa says, in the same vein as a wedding, would you say that the volume comments also apply to a restaurant with no dance floor? Uh, yeah, I'm sure, sure you're going to agree, Jason. You don't want to be blasting people out when they're eating, right? Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we, we, we definitely say that. Listen, people, uh, I don't, don't want to have to tell you this, but all good things come to an end. Uh, Jason has to get on with his day. Uh, and guess what? I'm going home. I was here till nine o'clock. Uh, uh, I was I was um, uh, doing some podcast recordings last night. I've got some great ones coming up for you guys on the Tales from the Dance Floor podcast, which is on Spotify, etc. So um, I was recording some some new ones last night. So I was here very late. I'm going home. Jason's got his day to, uh, to get on with. All I want to do is share with you uh, the fact that if you're interested in the course that we've been talking about that Jason is making with Digital DJ Tips about how to, it's called The Complete Wedding DJ and it's about how to be a high paid wedding DJ, how to get the best gigs. Um, and I'd like to respectfully disagree with someone um, who I know, see, I know what you're saying here, see, but you know, um, we disagree with you on this one, who says people want fast, uh, people want great and cheap people nowadays do not want to pay for a great service. Jason, don't be, you know, I don't, I know you, you're a humble guy, but give me some numbers that people will pay for a wedding. How many thousands will people pay for a big wedding? I, I don't know. I mean, we do weddings that start at $3,000. We do weddings that's, that that this past weekend, we had a couple of weddings on the books that were 12, 13, and 14, $15,000. So I, 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 I beg differ that that's, I feel like the, if the conversation with people want cheap comes in, then you're not justifying your value the right way. That's the conversation you need to really have with yourself. And you might be appealing to the wrong people. You might not be telling your story the right way, but people will invest in the experience if you give them a reason to invest in the experience. And obviously, regionally and across the country, things might vary from end to end. But where I sit right now in New Jersey, which is one of the most populated and talent rich uh, areas of the country in terms of options for like wedding entertainment. Um, when I had started my company 10 years ago, I had charged 1350 for a four hour wedding presentation. And everyone that I knew told me that I was absolutely crazy and that I would never, ever, ever, ever get it. So much so that I tattooed the word believe on my arm right here, right here. I tattooed the word believe on my arm because now, 10 years later, we my personal pricing packages start at $3,500 just for four hours of music, just to walk in the door with two speakers and a, and a, and a, and a DJ system. Um, so I, I understand kind of like that pain point or the, maybe the argument, but I have a feeling that there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of like negate that argument from even happening by presenting your content in a consistent and professional way that will get people interested in your services that are willing to pay for your services. If of course everything matches, the talent checks out, everything makes sense and whatnot. It's a value conversation, not an investment conversation. Awesome. Well, there you go, people. Um, of course, we have got a big training program that's designed to, you know, uh, that's designed to, to to build on the stuff Jason's saying now. But it is <coughs> it is definitely possible to be the top 
wedding mobile DJ in your area and to charge the prices and there are people paying them. By the way, if anyone's interested in, in, uh, in finding out more about that course, uh, you can go, unfortunately I haven't prepared and got the link on the screen, but um, my team will share it underneath. Uh, you can go to djtips.co, so no M on the end, djtips.co slash wedding. So djtips.co slash wedding uh, and you can drop your email address in there and Jason will let you know about this course. Um, it's going to be ready uh, this fall or this autumn uh, for those of you outside the USA. Uh, so there we go. We're done. Jason, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and uh, from Digital DJ Tips, from Jason over there. See you, Jason. Give us a wave. Uh, it's been it's been great. Thank you for joining Thank us you. for Tuesday Tips Live. We'll be back here next week. Keep an eye out. Uh, go to djtips.co slash wedding if you want to know more about this. Uh, meanwhile, get good, get out there and make the moments, people. Till next time.